branch extended for our sins and all the branch to say. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. I'm glad you're here. Today we're going to discuss a very difficult subject for many listeners. And it has to do with the Jezebel narcissist and using children as weapons. But let us pray first. Father God, we just come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, seeking your help, your guidance, your deliverance, power, your freedom, and your help for our families, Lord, for the families of those listening that have children in which the schism between the father and the mother has produced separation or even divorce, and the children have become the victims of this separation or divorce, and they've been used as pawns and weapons against the other parent. And we are just looking for your intervention in our families. If our families may be healed, let them be healed. If the narcissist or the, the prideful behavior on, on the part of both uh, spouses uh, can be healed, we, we come against narcissism and pride in, in either spouse um, of those that are listening. We pray on behalf of all those listening that if they're seeking uh, a reuniting of the family and deliverance, we pray for that deliverance. But if there can't be, Father God, we're asking you to defang the enemy in the lives of the narcissist that would steal the children or ignore their children because both phenomena occur. Sometimes narcissists will make it so the other parent can't be involved in the child's life at a level that he or she should, and other narcissists will just ignore their children completely and and, uh, leave them in the hands of their children. Um, They'll ignore their they'll ignore their children and leave them in the hands of the other spouse to to look after. So, Father God, we are just asking you for healing in either situation and just to bring a situation where parents can influence their children's lives for the positive rather than the negative. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and I also come against any spirit, demonic spirit that would come against this podcast, either through my own words or through the ears of the listener by distorting anything that I have to say. And I ask, Father God, that you would lead this. Let this not be about my intellect or my own thoughts. Let this be about your Holy Spirit guiding this podcast so that as many people as possible may be helped by it. And I'm just asking you, Father God, to take over and to run this podcast. I ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So here we are, dear listener, discussing the most important thing in the world to you, and that is your children. And in a way, it's almost better if you're going to have a fallout with a narcissist to have done so before children are born and brought into the world. Because the one thing about having children that's different is the fact that in almost every case, you can't go no contact. If you need to go no contact, if you need to get away from this spouse... Children often require that you continue to have communications with a person that is out to get you, that doesn't care about you, that only cares about themselves, and they want to punish you. Narcissists love to punish their victims for their insolence. And you, dear listener, if you're a victim of a narcissist, you have been insolent against them because you stood up to them. And your insolence must be punished. And the thing that they like to do is to punish people with the thing that's most important to them. So if you are very much into your children and want to have your children around, your narcissist is going to do his or her level best to make sure that that process is made as difficult as possible or impossible. I mean, there's a plethora of videos out there. I remember one video that was posted, and I'll post a link to it, where this man had brought his child Uh, two children back to his wife and he had taken them to get a haircut and she literally lost it and she was like how dare you take my children to get a haircut as if that wasn't within the right of a father or the other parent to have the child's haircut so her reaction was obviously an overreaction but once again she was trying to punish him 
for his insolence. And her mother was there also, and she made sure to do so too. You know what? I think I'm going to play a clip from this video so you can hear it for yourself without having to click elsewhere. Because I need answers. As custodial parent, I'm supposed to know exactly what's what. Kim, can I leave now? Can you please tell me where you cut my children's hair? I cut, you had I no gave, authority. I gave my kids a haircut. You had no authority. Did you cut? Do you have my kids behind us? Did you consult with me? Kim, let me peel off. Did you consult with me? Can I leave now? Let's be a man for once. Can I leave? Consult with me. Ma, can you get the police because... He ain't taking my photo because he won't tell me exactly what happened. And he has no right to do that. I asked you a simple question. So your mom going to get the police? I don't know. I'm asking you a question. Where did you do this? Earl, they don't... Kim, you're really me. making the kids nervous. Earl, I know my own children ever since. Okay? Ever since what? I know my children. Ever, ever since what? Since you abandoned them. I abandoned I know them? them, okay? Oh, I thought I left you. No, I'm recording it, too, just to make sure that we're even, Stephen, okay? Yeah, I don't so care about no that. problem. Oh, 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 don't scratch the car. Oh, no, scratch the car. Go ahead. Do whatever you want to do. Come on. Let me hold the train. No, that's their train. I got the train until... Okay, hold on. No, you hold on to that train. Don't let him take that away from you. Nope. Don't let him put the, the train on the car, please, Then Kim. you need to tell me exactly what happened. Oh, see, you got the boys crying. Well, you took his don't, train. Don't scratch the car. I didn't take it. Don't scratch Answer the car. the question. Give daddy a kiss. Give daddy a kiss. Answer the question. <laughs> Can I pick him up, Kim? Put him down. Can I pick the You're kid up? You're over the time. Let me pick You're the kid. over the time. So I can't pick the kids Let up? Let go. Would you tell me where you did? So I can't pick the kids Can up? Can you tell me what you did? They got a haircut, Kim. Where? Where, Earl? You put a shaver to their head. How dare you do that? I can't listen anymore. That is so typical of a Jezebel control spirit. She had to know where the boys got a haircut, and the haircut was... They're, they were fine. Nothing happened to her children because clippers were put to their heads. It's ridiculous. But she had to control him and emasculate him. Did you hear how she said, be a man? For once, be a man. It's that sort of thing which I'm addressing that it's never going to be made easy. And if they're put out at all, you are going to hear about it and they are going to attack you with it. And so what they're really trying to do, in my view, in that case, is to wear you down with, there's a word the secular world uses that I would rather not use on a more of a religious broadcast, but I'm going to use a softer word. They're crap testing you. So when they crap test you, it's to get you to the point where you think, oh, it's not worth it. That's what they're trying to do. It's not worth it. In the case of this woman and the boys... Uh, that she had, she's going to crap test him to where he just throws up his hands and says it's not worth it. And that's a tough place to be because that father, he wants to do right by his children. He wants to help his children. He wants to provide for his children. He wants to be with his children. He wants to go sit in the barbershop with them, which is customary to do with little children, little toddlers like that, and be there to watch him get his first haircut. That's kind of like one of those remembered father-son bonding events that a lot of kids have. Their first time in the, in the barber shop, sitting in the chair, getting their hair cut, becoming a big boy. Here's a clip from an old movie called Destination Tokyo in which the captain of the submarine is played by Cary Grant and the memory that he says is his best memory to his crewmates is this memory of being with his son in the barber shop and his first haircut or one of his first haircuts. Take a listen. Well, I think the biggest kick I got last year happened on dry land, Oklahoma City. I took my little boy to the barber shop to get his first haircut with me. Put him up on that little board they use for children, you know. I told the barber to give him a navy haircut. I just sat down and watched. Well, my boy asked the barber, would he please cut it so that his hair would drop down in front of his eyes? He'd like to see a fall. All the men waiting their turns were grinning at me. Well, my boy just sat up there, not saying anything, just looking at me, very proud. Just looking at me with his eyes warm. It was my turn next. And my little fellow asked the barber, could he please sit on my lap while I got my hair cut? Well, the barber knew the boy and I don't see very much of each other, but with patrols and all, 
And he said, sure. So Margot climbed up on my lap. Oh, I guess it really wasn't much. But after a while, he put his head back on my shoulder and looked at all the men waiting their turns and said, this is my daddy. Just something in the way he said it. But that was my biggest kick of last year. Touching scene, right? But that's not what an arc jazz spouse would want. In fact, they're going to attack that. They're going to attack the very thing that would bring a father and a son closer together because narcissists want to drive wedges between other between people. They don't have love themselves. They worship at the altar of hatred. And if there can be love between a father or a mother and a, and a child, and that narcissist sees it, the narcissist gets jealous. They're jealous of that bonding that can and does will occur between two normally functioning human beings. And they can't have that. They can't and won't have that. Not on their watch. They're going to make sure that it's not there. So another way that they will take advantage of a situation is to bring false accusation against the other spouse. They will have no problem lying about what the other spouse didn't do. They'll make things up. For example, I was watching one video where a lady admitted, this was on Dr. Phil, who's, I'm not a fan of him, by the way, but I'm just saying it was on there. And this lady, I'll post the the, uh, link, actually admitted to falsely accusing her husband of hitting her when he had never done so. And so, or being way more aggressive than he actually was, and she admitted to doing it because it gave her an advantage. And narcissists have no trouble doing that. You know what? Let's go ahead and take a listen to this clip from the Dr. Phil show. So you just, do you do anything wrong here? I don't feel like I did. No. I mean, he took, you know, my he took my love and the vows that I made to him when we got married and totally tromped all over that for the first year of our marriage. Disrespected me, disrespected my home, disrespected our marriage. I understand why you feel justified for putting him in jail. I'm just asking if you ran a red light in putting him in jail. Did you make statements that weren't true? I may have said that there was, there was punching or hitting and and there was there was not that to my to my recollection well, you, recollection, you didn't but there was maybe say it. You either said it or you didn't. You either said he hit me and punched me or you didn't. Did I, you I say did. It? You did. I did. And did he hit you and punch you? No. Okay. Not to my recollection. You knew it wasn't true when you said it though. I mean, let's be honest. Yes. You, you knew it wasn't true when you said it, right? Yes. So you made a conscious decision to embellish the story. And that's a lie. I'm not saying this isn't the biggest creep in the world and you shouldn't divorce him before dark today. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that he's not mentally abusive, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, and even physically abusive. He may be, he may deserve yes. to be under the jail. I, I, what if, I'm not saying that you should put up with that at all under any theory whatsoever. What I'm asking you is did you or did you not file a false police report when you said that he punched you and hit you and you knew at the time that he did not? Yes. Okay, so this is a long way of coming around to saying, yeah, I lied to the police and got put in jail. (laughs) She laughed and smiled there, but that was 10 months of that guy's life sitting in jail because of a false accusation. And I've especially seen it from the woman's perspective. Now, again, I've talked very neutral gender-wise, but... If the woman can portray the man as being violent and that she's afraid for herself, when many times a narc Jez has physically manhandled and abused her husband to death, and she will portray it as if he's the one that's been violent and she's just afraid she can't defend herself kind of thing, when he's not a violent person, that's not even in his nature, he's not that type of person. And so now he's got to defend that or there'll be uh, accusations of rape or other physical overpowering things that a man could do if he wanted to, because generally speaking, 
most husbands are stronger than their wives. It's just a matter of genetics and, and being part of a different gender. Uh, and, and that thing could happen, but they will actually either make up stories or they'll inflame situations to look like they were defenseless and there was nothing they could do. And then the fake crocodile tears come out and suddenly, the, 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 in this case, the man spouse has left just shaking his head as if these stories have been made up about him and there was nothing that he, he could do. And they'll use it for leverage. The Jezebel narc, man or woman, will use any situation where the victim has reacted in a way that would be questionable if the person had been pushed to the very limits of their patience. But they'll, they'll push and goad and, and jab and, 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 and stab until the victim reacts in such a way, which is a proper reaction, to, to defend his or her own dignity and, and to not be bullied because that's what Jezebel and Narcissus are. They're bullies. So they're just trying to defend themselves like a kid in the schoolyard, keep him from getting a black eye. And suddenly the narcissist will scream from the rooftops about what that person did to defend him or herself. And suddenly the narc is an expert at turning themselves into the victim and suddenly they're the victim. And so as that applies to kids, they, the ones that are trying to limit their, part, their former spouse's ability to see their child, that's what they'll do. They will make themselves seem like the victim, even though they've been the expert skilled predator from day one, and they will steal that child. And I noticed it seems like the children that get taken, stolen, I'm going to say stolen, they're stolen that narcs steal are from the other spouse who really wants to be with their child, wants to have an influence, wants to care about the child. And the narc is not going to allow that because they know that that victim, the spouse they're not allowing to see the child, is going to care and they don't have any real care inside of them. They do things out of obligation or because they, they have to do it, but it's not out of love. And they do not want the other spouse to eclipse themselves because they know they know they're an empty shell. They know there's no love. They know there's no joy. There's no peace. There's no Jesus, really. That's what it comes down to. There's no Jesus. And if the victim has Jesus, they do not want that child exposed to Jesus. And that's another aspect of it. Most of the time, narc Jezebels that aren't trying to act like they're Christians. A lot of them do. There are a lot of narc Je Jezebels in the Christian world, we know. But if they don't care about that, they will then turn on their, their, their spouse and say, oh, you're like in a cult or you're, you know, you have cult-like like pursuits and I don't want my child exposed to that. I don't want them exposed to, re to religious lies and fables and, 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 and legends and whatnot. Which, as we, we know, we all know as Christians that Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. He is the only way to eternal life. And so, of course, that demon, that Jezebel demon inside that partner, that narcissistic demon inside that partner, does not want their child exposed to the truth or to Jesus Christ. They don't want that child to make it. That demon wants to take that child to hell right along with the narcissist if, if the narcissist doesn't repent. So you got that aspect of it, too. And... But they will portray themselves as being so innocent and so sweet, and it's really them, and the other, the other parents an abuser, and and uh, you know sometimes I've seen that in the comment sections. I've I've seen people make comments about their spouse, like the spouse is the abuser. But I can I can I can see that tinge of this sounds like a setup. I can see that in some of the comments, and I'm not trying to put any of you guys or trigger anybody. I'll put you on edge by hearing that, but I'm just saying that I know that there are actually narcissist Jezebels posting comments as if they're the victims, and I can, I can, I can, I can just, I believe it's by the discernment and the power of God, you can see there's been a twisting, there's been an inflaming, there's been a, a turning, and a complete justification of self. And it reminds me of a proverb: is that uh, one of the proverbs that says that um, something to the effect of 
every man is just in his own his own eyes, but his neighbor searcheth them out. And what that means is that everybody thinks that they're right and they're, that they're righteous in what they're doing, but the, the person's neighbor, that is the observer, the, the, that, that can see the person, is thinking, no, maybe, maybe there's something wrong here. And I, I see that. It's not in every post. I don't want to say that at all, but it, there's definitely a good percentage. I would say 10%, maybe, maybe more. Maybe more I'm not noticing, but sometimes I, I, I see in the comments, and I'm like, no, that sounds like a narc writing that, and that's what they do. And they've written scripts for themselves in their heads, or their demons have, for when you get to court or you get in a situation where you're, they put you on the defense, they go on the offensive against you, your wrongdoing, and you're just sitting there, you're thinking, I've overlooked so many things that this person's done to me. Because, you know, there's another proverb that says that love covers a multitude of sins. And what that means is that when you love somebody, you're willing to look past uh, some foibles and to forgive and to not publicize it. But a narcissist, they will, when, when, when they're pushed in a corner, they'll publicize all kinds of accusations, some based in a little bit of truth because none of us are perfect. But a lot of it, take, take a little kernel of truth and then just inflame it and make it way worse than what it was. They're experts at that. And they love to go into self-pity mode at that point, and all of a sudden they're the victim and everybody hates them and no one's there to defend them. And that's a lot of times when a white knight, that is, someone will come along and they act so helpless and, and pitiful that somebody will come along and get bamboozled by them and be drawn in to the, the spider web, the the Black Widow spider web and get drawn in and, and want to help and want to scaffold that person and lift them up. And all of a sudden they're drawn into that spider web and then six months later they're the ones getting abused. It's such a terrible cycle. It's a vicious cycle that never ends for the narc. They're going to continue to find a source of a person to abuse and to try to kill or to get that person to want to kill themselves. Which leads me to one way that narcissist Jezebels do get us to do wrong, and that is through substance abuse. A lot of um, people who are victims of narcissist Jezebels just give up and just start drinking to numb it. They just want to be numb. They don't want to have to deal with it. And when it comes to children, once you start doing that, then you become part of the problem too. You become the, the part of the problem where because you're, you're trying to cope by turning to alcohol— Suddenly that abusive parent can say, oh, he's, he or she's a drunk and she's drinking, he's drinking, he can't look after the kids and then you lose your kids. I mean, it's such a great play. It's just so destructive. And that's why if you are a spouse that's uh, been discredited or disenfranchised by a narc, you need to be seeking God and Jesus Christ for, to cope so that he can keep you in walking in freedom. He can keep you from turning to other things. You know, if you turn, what you turn to when you're in your worst times is your God. So if you're turning to alcohol during your worst moments to cope, that's your idol. You need to stop doing that and turn to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, who is the proper um, place to go to cope. So, all right, that was a little bit of an aside. So here we have, we have our kids we have one parent that has stolen away. The other way a narc jez will go, especially those that are uh, substance abusers, is they will abandon their kids for the high. They'll abandon everybody. They'll just, it's like the people that you see on that show Intervention. They, they just lose empathy for their own children, lose empathy for their, their families, and... They'll just run and they'll leave a spouse high and dry and the spouse is left there holding the bag, having to do everything, having to be both mother and father. And that was never intended either. Okay, so I did address both sides of it. I've spent a lot more time on the, the initial theft of a child. One thing that a parent, parents can do, so let's say you've got a custodial parent, the other parent has some kind of visitation set up and the custodial parent will move. Even 
a couple hours away or to another state or across the country. And once they move, that other non-custodial parent is suddenly left in the lurch and can't easily see his or her children. And months go by, maybe even years, and the child doesn't know the parent. And that parent that moved, maybe it was for a job, but I think a lot of times it's for selfish reasons. They may remarry and they don't want to deal with their ex, and so they move. And suddenly the child is stuck without a biological parent and has this new uh, step parent that is not the biological. It's not the same. And it's not meant to be the same. And it's that kind of disruption of marriage that God is against. He's against divorce. As Jesus said, may, may a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they become one. That's never meant to be broken. As Jesus also said, what God has put together, let no man tear asunder. And so Satan hates marriage. He hates marriages that last. He hates, he loves adultery. He loves incest. He loves perversion. He loves anything that will disrupt what God originally intended with marriage. That's his job. His job is to destroy marriage and destroy the family. And that's why if you look at statistics for Children that are of one parent families, you know, especially fatherless families, look at all these statistics. Look at how many, uh, how, mu- how much greater chance there is to not finish high school, how much greater chance there is to not go on to college, which, by the way, I don't advise anyone to go to college anymore because it's just brainwashing. And homeschool your kids if you can. Okay, that's my rant on that. How many kids end up incarcerated that are children of? fatherless uh, families. I mean, look at all these stats. It's insane the differences that occur when there's no nuclear family. And so, again, that's what Satan wants. He wants to divide families. He wants to put a wedge between them. But even Jesus said he came not to bring peace but a sword. And he, that family members would be against each other. But he, they're against each other because Satan has part of the family in his court and Jesus has part of the family in, in his court. And two can't walk together unless they agree. And if a husband and a spouse are, don't agree on Jesus himself and on his place in, in their lives, it's hard to maintain. And then once there's been offenses and people get offended and narcissists take over with selfishness and they don't care about their spouse, once that occurs and then... Child theft goes on or child abandonment. It's one or the other. And so I remember listening to one of Be Good 4000's videos, and I'll put a link to that, where he actually talked, I think, directly to children. And he said to children, don't automatically assume the parent that you didn't live with didn't want you. Don't automatically assume that there wasn't some kind of sabotage by the parent that actually did raise you. You need to really look into it and talk to that other parent. And I advise the parent that's been disenfranchised of his his or her children, I advise you to keep a journal. Write everything down. Keep track of all correspondence. Have everything on record so that when that child's old enough, you can sit down with them and tell them the truth. A lot of people will say, never, never do anything to uh, discredit the other parent. Well, when the parent has actually stolen the child and made it so you can't see your child and the child becomes an adult, I think it's good to have things on record. You know, a journal that maybe you wrote directly to the child every time you thought about the person, how much you wanted to see them and keep record of it and hand that, hand the, that journal to that person that child of yours when he's he or she's 18 and and emancipated from the house and living on their own let them let them see that you did care but that you were sabotaged at every turn i think it's important to have have record of that and to and to show how much you did in fact want to be in your child's life i think that's really important the child needs to know that i mean there's a spirit of rejection comes on children when they're not with both parents and when there's a, a divorce and children are hurt by divorce. I mean, those stats are for a reason. 
They don't feel safe. They feel rejected. When they feel rejected, they'll do things to get attention that are negative in nature, that are sinful because they get some eyes on them. Because children are supposed to have the attention of both parents, and when they don't get that, especially if the parent that is custodial is a narc, they're never going to really get loving attention from that parent either. It's all going to be a masquerade of love. It's not going to be real. And that child is going to be insecure as possible and will potentially do things to hurt him or herself. So I think I'm going to prayer now. I hope you'll forgive me for my voice. It's been scratchy this month. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I praise you and thank you for each and every person listening. If there's anyone listening that's been disenfranchised from seeing their children or being with their children, I ask that you would strengthen them. I ask that you would bring deliverance to the situation. I ask that you would help them to have patience, but more so to bring an end to this separation, bring an end to this torture that is not being able to be in the life or lives of the child or the children that they have. I thank you and praise you for reuniting in Jesus' name, reuniting parents with children and even estranged spouses together so that the family can be back together and the children could have the best possible situation. I'm asking you to deliver narcissists in these situations so that the family could be reunited. But if they can't, I'm asking you to just pour out your favor on the, on the victims that haven't done this great evil. I'm asking you to bring back the opportunities to be with their children, even to get custody if they're the ones that will do a better job of it. I'm asking you, in fact, yes, I'm asking that in Jesus' name that if these narc jezes cannot be redeemed or they, they won't receive correction from you, I'm asking for every listener that they would get custody of their children or at least half custody or a way to, to be with their children more and to have a bigger influence because the influence of your love is way more necessary than narcissistic influence of a narcissistic parent. So I praise you and thank you for that outcome for as many as listen, Lord, just give them favor and make the crooked path straight for them. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There's a lot more to cover with this idea of children being used as weapons. But dear listener, really my advice to anyone is just to seek God in prayer daily. Let Him lead you. If you think about it, a lot of people lost children in the Old Testament. I mean, you look back in the book of Genesis, starting with Abraham. Of course, he, uh, he was asked to put Isaac on the altar. And of course, God gave him a, another uh, a ram instead. That's where God got his name, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, because he provided a ram instead and and that was obviously a type and shadow of Jesus but if you think about next um, with Esau and his children Jacob and Esau and of course you know Jacob had to leave because Esau wanted to kill him but after Jacob pretty much uh, tricked him stole his birthright Esau's birthright and Jacob was gone for a long time from Esau and didn't come back, I guess it was about 20 years. I'm not entirely sure about it. It was at least 14 years, we know. But it was a long time before he could return. And, of course, from Jacob, he lost his son Joseph. So there's a lot of that. It seems like every one of the patriarchs, if you look back, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all lost children, or at least time with children. And... and I just know for those of us that, that have, or those of you that have, use the time to get closer to God. You know, this life, number one, first and foremost, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then your neighbor as yourself. And yes, our children are very important, but they're not more important than God and Jesus. Jesus said, if you love your mother, father, husband, wife, son, daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. And so... For a lot of us, let's use the time. Use the time to draw closer to God, to seek Him out, to, to stoke the flames of your love affair with Him. And then when your child is restored unto you, you can then obviously rejoice in that. Because, of course, Abraham's son Isaac, or Esau, was restored to him. Esau's son Jacob was restored to him. 
and Jacob saw Joseph again. So have that belief that you will see your child again. You will be with your child again. God will redeem the time. He will, what the locust and the canker worm has taken, God will restore a hundredfold. You know, Jesus even said that, that those that give up, you know, family or lands or anything for his sake shall inherit eternal life. And in, the, and in this life, we get a hundredfold. So wait and trust God on that hundredfold blessing. Don't take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Let him handle this situation just as he did for Mordecai and Esther in the book of Esther where Haman wanted to kill Mordecai and all the Jews and he made a gallows on his own property that he was going to see to it that Mordecai was hung in and he hung himself. He, he himself was hung in the, the gallows that he had made for Mordecai. So a lot of times the things that narcissists and Jezebels do through their lies and deception if they don't repent, they are doing it in the end to themselves. They are going to reap what they've sown and God will bring redemption for us, for those Christians that are waiting to have this redemption. He will bring it in due, in due time. And they, it's definitely not as quick as you might hope, but he will, he is behind the scenes doing things on a daily basis. And he's also showing a lot of grace and toward the narcissist Jezebel to give them a chance to repent. And remember in Revelation 2.20, he gives Jezebel a space to repent. And he does that. God is um, not quick to anger, but at some point it's going to be enough is enough level. And when it gets to that point, you can trust that God's going to handle it. So just put the matter in his hands, trust him. And for those of you that are have been left high and dry and abandoned. Keep praying for your spouse or former spouse that they would be healed of whatever has them having run off and abandoned their children, that they would also be restored and and so that your, your child can know the biological parent. All right, well, this concludes the podcast. Thanks for listening and be blessed everyone that did. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
arms of his love In the arms of his love Servant is not above his master. If they hated him, they'll hate you. It's good to be even as your master. Speaking the words of truth. Prophet is not without honor, except in his own house and in his hometown. It happened to Jesus too. Jesus came not to bring peace, but a sword. He separated the sheep from the goats. Liars in the church will only fail. The Lord shall raise us up. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Cause the Lord shall raise us up. And he'll lead us beside still waters. And he'll lead us in the power. Love, and we will find our way to Him. Oh, we found our way to Him, and He embraces like a friend in the arms of His love. Oh, it's love in the arms of His love. of his love.